Let's open up then to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. And Father, thank you again for a beautiful day. Lord, uh, we live in very troubling times. Uh, But I thank you there's always peace, Lord, where your people are gathered. Places where you're worshipped, Lord, there's confidence found. Lord, and, uh, and I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you we can step out of the craziness of life and, and, and gather together here. My Lord, um, and, and a continued sense of worship, Lord, as we pick up your word, I pray again that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, and and make application, conviction, whatever it is, my Lord, that you have in store for your people, help me to stay out of the way. Lord, um, I do pray that as individuals, you would sort of place us on your lap and we would know you, the author of the word. And then as a church body, speak to us, Lord, that uh, we would become all that you desire. So, Lord, the time here is yours, not mine. I pray that you would speak and speak loudly. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, gang. So, Revelation chapter 2, we've been uh, studying uh, each of the seven letters weekly, the seven letters to the churches uh, in Revelation. You remember first that we study the letter to the church in Ephesus. It was a church that had lost its priority. It wasn't a loveless church. They just left their first love. And sometimes that happens in churches, doesn't it? We get so caught up in policies and procedures and things that sometimes Jesus gets left behind. And they didn't lose their first love. They actually left him. It was the unprioritized church, really. And then we looked at the letter to the church in Smyrna. That was the church that was suffering It was a church where where Jesus acknowledged all those good deeds and the good things they were doing, and he never gives them an an indictment. He just tells them to be patient, you know, hang in there, continue to do what you do. And then we looked at the the lead to the church of Pergamos. It was a church that was in compromise, poor teaching, bad theology, bad doctrines were entering into the church, and, well... Theology has consequences, doesn't it? And, uh, and now then, we consider the, the letter to the church of Thyatira, which is what you might call the adulterous church. We'll see that as we move forward. So we begin now at verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, as we've stated several times, the word angel here, angelos, it speaks of a messenger, it can speak of the, the divine messengers, the, the angels, or it can speak of an earthly messenger. And I think when we looked at chapter 1, we pretty much firmly established that this is to earthly messengers. We might even consider it to be the pastor or church leadership. To the, oh, so of the church in Thyatira. Now, Thyatira was located about 35 miles southeast of Pergamos. Um, of the seven cities that are mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, this is the smallest of the cities. Strangely, though, they get the longest letter. And that's a roundabout way of saying that we have a really long sermon this morning. So, <laughs> But it began as a, as a Macedonian colony under Alexander the Great. Um, It was small, but it was wealthy. Uh, It was a commercial center during the days of the Seleucid Empire and had really developed um, a very large wool and textile industry there. It was known for its dyes uh, that it made. In fact, you remember in Acts chapter 16, Paul would meet in Philippi this woman, Lydia of Thyatira, a seller of purple dyes. You see, that all came out of that region. But there were other... Trades, as you would expect in any city. But the interesting thing about this city in particular, it was loaded with trade unions. The metalsmiths, the textile workers, the potters, the bakers, the dyers, even artists and slave owners were part of a trade guild. Everybody in Thyatira was part of the union. Continuing on in verse 18, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, 
and his feet like fine brass. Now, as we've stated, every one of the self-descriptions of Jesus in the letters of chapters 2 and 3 comes from the description of Jesus in chapter 1. And here we see three things regarding Jesus as it relates to the particular needs or issues of this particular city he writes to. <clears throat> First, he says, these things says the Son of God. Now, three times Jesus is referred to as the Son in the book of Revelation. Twice he's the Son of Man. That's in Revelation 1.13 and 14.14. 14. But here he's the Son of God. While Son of Man speaks of His humanity, Son of God speaks of His deity. His divine authority that comes with that deity even. Who has eyes like a flame of fire. Now the word fire here in Greek is, is poor, which ultimately we get our word pure from. <clears throat> Now, as we considered this in Revelation chapter 1, we, we considered Jesus' gaze and that it reveals that which is holy and that which is not. It is really a divine scrutiny that's being communicated here. It's a scrutiny that determines our, our works and the motivations behind them. Continuing on, he says, and his feet like fine brass. Now, as you know, of course, in the Bible, brass is often used to typify judgment, right? Sometimes the word bronze is there, brass and bronze. The terms are used almost interchangeably in the Bible, but they're two different alloys, as, as you know. But brass was known, especially as being particularly hard. It's symbolic of judgment. You remember, of course, the, the, the brass altar that was there in the tabernacle complex where sacrifices were made. It was that place of judgment. A hand was laid on the animal and the animal was slaughtered in place of those who were bringing it. It speaks of judgment to you and I. And so corporately then, these, these three descriptions reveal to, to us Jesus in his divine authority, his divine scrutiny, and his divine judgment. Now when Jesus opens up a letter like that, you can be sure there's going to be some heavy stuff coming. He says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Now, he said this to every church so far, I know your works. As we said, that's, it speaks of deeds. Sometimes it speaks of the energy behind those deeds as well. He says, your love, right? The word there is agape. It's often translated as charity. It, it is the love of God, right? I mean, Romans 5 tells us God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God. It's a charitable love. It's not a love that loves somebody for the sake of getting back. It's a love that just loves somebody for their sake. And that's the kind of love that this particular church in Thyatira was demonstrating. There, he says, I know your works. He says, I know your love. And so he's qualifying their works as being charitable works. Maybe they had a thrift store. I like thrift stores. Maybe they had a soup kitchen. I don't really like soup kitchens. But, you know, whatever they were doing. He says, I know your service, right? Diokonia, it, it, it speaks of, of serving or of ministry. It's typically giving aid and attending to the needs of people. It's from which we get the word deacon. And it is the fruit of agape love. If you love charitably, then you will serve selflessly. One is the cause, the other is the effect. One is the stimulus, the other is the response. He says, I know your faith. Faith here would speak of, in terms of moral conviction. Because they relied on Christ, they obeyed his command to love their neighbor as themselves, you see. He says, and your patience. You know, we, we've mentioned before, of course, this isn't just patience. This is cheerful endurance. 
This isn't just, you know, clenching your teeth and powering through problems. This is having joy even in the midst of the problems. Might I just say that Christian patience is not resentful? Maybe that's a word for some of us in here this morning. Our patient ought not to be a resentful patient. So if you put this together, the church in Thyatira, they were out there doing good deeds. They were serving charitably. They were serving in faith and they were serving patiently. And if that wasn't enough, wait, there's more, right? And as for your works, the last are more than the first. More than here in, in Greek, it refers to things greater in quantity or greater in quality. See, this particular church, they weren't complacent. They were continuing to grow in their service and in their love. They weren't resting on their past works. Sometimes churches do that, don't, don't we? Oh yeah, remember when we did this? Remember when we built that radio station nine years ago? Remember when that, you know, all those were the good old days. The good old days ought to be right now, pressing forward. You see, they weren't resting in past works. They were moving forward towards the future. And, and, and again, as I've said before, this church here might have sort of met a shopping list of the average church seeker of the particular time. But as has been said by Shakespeare and even those before him, all that glitters is not always gold. Beginning now at verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. See, this church, on one hand... Things seem to be going pretty well. On the other hand, there were some major problems. I will state this, though. Notice always that the Lord recognizes the good works before he calls out the bad. And maybe you're raising teenagers this morning, you need a little bit of wisdom. I'd say follow the Lord's example right there. Be careful to acknowledge the good things your kids are doing, because it's really easy to focus on the bad. Or maybe you're newly married, and you need a little bit of wisdom. I, again, encourage you, follow the Father's example right here. Let's acknowledge some good stuff. Amen? Maybe you're a supervisor, and you're supervising the island of misfit toys in your work center right now, and you need a little bit of wisdom. Well, you know what I'm going to say. So, but we do see two things here in verses 20 and 21 that the Lord brings to light. He says, because you allow that woman Jezebel, we'll stop right there. The word you here, because you allow that woman Jezebel, is in the singular. It's not in the plural. It's a letter written to the messenger of the church of Thyatira, and he says, because you allow. Where's the problem? The church leadership, isn't it? Maybe it's the pastor, the guy at the pulpit. But Jesus is calling somebody out specifically. Before he calls out the Jezebel lady, we'll talk about her, he's calling out them because you allow it. Now, I find that interesting because, in my opinion, right, I'm going to qualify my opinion, the New American Standard is probably the best translation um, at least, not, not a dynamic translation, but what's the other word we use? The, the what? Not amplified, it's the opposite of that. It's the, the literal. literal, best literal translation, I think. That's just my opinion. But I try to do my own scholarship and I bring out differences. But it, you, the New American Standard uses the word tolerate. And I really find that interesting in light of contemporary social thought and the things that we tolerate or toleration or tolerance. And Jesus says, because you tolerate this particular individual. And it seems there was a certain problematic personality here in the church in Thyatira. I doubt her name was Jezebel, literally. I would imagine that name had probably fallen out of favor, much like the name Judas did after the crucifixion. 
That even happens today. Did you, this is a true story. In the 60s, the name Karen was, was the third most common girl name given to baby girls was Karen. Nobody calls their kid Karen anymore, right? <laughs> There's a certain dynamic that happens. And now, I will say this, though. Jezebel, though, in the anglicized version is Isabel. And so it's not unheard of. But I doubt this lady's name was Jezebel. But I think what's most important is the association that's being made to the readers regarding the Jezebel of the Old Testament in, in First and Second Kings. That Jezebel was the daughter of a Sidonian king who married Ahab, who was the king of the northern ten tribes. And, and uh, she inspired her husband into greater idolatry than he was already involved in. She also persecuted God's prophets. And she even had a man killed to assume his property. So she was kind of a shrewd, a ruthless, and a headstrong kind of woman. You know, be careful who you marry, Lee. Amen. You know, if you marry a woman like that, put a chair up on the corner of your roof. You know what I'm talking about. Now, regarding this particular individual, Jesus also qualifies her this way, who calls herself a prophetess. That means she was self-ordained. Now, I've met several people over the years who've given me a business card that has their name and it says, Apostle of Jesus Christ or Prophet of Jesus Christ. Can I just say this? That if you go to a church where people sort of ordain themselves, just vote with your feet and get out of there. It just, I, I, I just say that because I've never known it to work out well. It always comes out to something weird. Even here, if there's going to be an ordina ordination, it's because the elders recognize God's work in a man's life. We're just recognizing what God is doing. But I'd be careful about taking titles upon yourself and such things. Not only does she call herself a prophetess, but she teaches and seduces my servants, he says. She was teaching as a self-appointed prophetess and seducing God's people in doing so. Now the word seduce here, Paneo, it means to cause to roam from safety, truth, or virtue, to lead astray or to deceive. Now, because of that, you understand in English why we use that word in the context that we do. Seduction in the sensual sense. But it really comes back to a virtuous kind of context that it's used in. Interesting also that the word and there is chi, and so it relates the seduction to the teaching. See, the word teach there is in the present active and seduce is in the present passive. And so what's implied in Greek then is that one is the result of the other. The seduction is the result of the teaching. As I said, theology has consequences. Seduce them to what? To commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. You have to understand, of course, that the idolatry of the Greco-Roman world involved sacrificing to idols and inevitably sexual immorality. Now you say, well, what's the big deal with meat sacrificed to idols? Well, Paul makes the point in 1 Corinthians 8 that it isn't a big deal. It's just meat. But in the case that somebody around you would be stumbled if you're eating meat sacrificed to an idol, then for heaven's sake, order off the vegetarian menu. That's all. But if somebody willfully offers that to an idol in some sort of idolatrous practice and then partakes of it, it is clearly sin. Again, the word and here in terms of immorality and idolatry, the word and there is a chi, and it's linking the two. Because inevitably, I'm going to tell you honestly, inevitably, idolatry always leads to sexual immorality. Because when man creates a God in his own image, that God gives a man exactly what he wants. It's inevitable, isn't it? 
But in all of this, this woman and her influence was being tolerated as if it was something good. And clearly, it wasn't. Now, why is it that church leadership won't deal with these kind of issues? Maybe the pastor was afraid of this lady. And consider Elijah, right? He kills 400 prophets of Baal there on Mount Carmel, and, and Jezebel sends him a message, tomorrow you're dead. And he runs like crazy. He'd stand up against 400 men, but one angry woman, he's, he's running. Again, men, be careful who you marry, amen? But ladies, don't think that you don't have an influence on your husband. But be careful about how you influence him. Maybe it was out of neglect that this woman was tolerated. Oh, the ministry's busy, is it not? But you ought not to be busy doing things of your own. You ought to be busy doing the Father's business. Maybe there's another reason. Either way, it's out of tolerance. Please understand that toleration in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It's what you tolerate that gives moral context to the term toleration. For those who think that toleration is virtuous, again, I would remind you of the words of G.K. Chesterton. He said, toleration is the virtue of those who believe anything or who don't believe anything. I would qualify it a little bit different in light of contemporary thought. I'd say toleration is the highest virtue of those who believe nothing sacred. And this is what was going on in the church. Now, does this go on in churches today? Are there strong personalities who are enforcing their will? And are there pastors who are terrified, afraid to upset people? Maybe we'll have a few extra chairs that are empty next week. Maybe the budget will drop. So what? Get busy about God's business. Doesn't mean you have to be harsh and caustic, but you can love somebody out the door and sometimes it's necessary. There was also a lack of repentance, verse 21. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. So somehow then, the issue had been brought to this woman. How that was, I don't know. Maybe the Lord raised up someone in the church to, to take a moral stand. Maybe somebody called her out personally for her sin. However it happened... There had been plenty of time already given to repent, and she refused to. Maybe she considered immorality and idolatry to be more virtuous than repentance. I'd say that's pretty common today, if we were honest. I hope it's not common here. But I, you know, you, I don't mind saying it. You see the Bethel stuff and the Hillsong stuff and all of that. Listen. It ought not to be. These are men building kingdoms under themselves. Not thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe this woman mistook God's patience as being God's endorsement. Sometimes people do that. Well, I'm getting away with it. You know, must be God's will. Scary stuff, right? Or maybe the ministry was about her will rather than God's. They're just, these are just, you know, sanctified speculations. That's all they are. The point is this, is there was time given for repentance and repentance didn't happen. Now we look at some consequences as a result of that, beginning at verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. It says, indeed, I will. Not I should, not I might. Jesus says, I will. There's an emphatic uh, or an imperative emphasis that's sort of placed here, indeed, I will. Cast her into a sickbed. Now, cast, balo, it, it really means to throw violently or to throw something without care to throw something down or to thrust it away. And the word sickbed, planeo, it, it refers to a couch or a bed or a bed that was used to carry sick people. 
This is kind of interesting because the place of sin becomes the place of judgment. Right? It's idolatry and immorality. And he says, I'll cast her into a bed. It'll be a sick bed. And this is in the present active. And so it implies that that process had already begun. That there was something going on in the church. There was something going on with this woman. It was a direct judgment from God regarding her influence in the church. Not only would he cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. So not only was this woman to suffer presently for her sin, but those who tolerated her and therefore empowered her would also see great tribulation. Now, the definite article isn't used here, right? It's just philipsis megas. It's not ha, philipsis megas. So it's not necessarily speaking of the great tribulation, right? That seven-year period of time that we'll look at when we begin in Revelation chapter 6. However, in Matthew chapter 24, specifically at verse 21, when Jesus describes the great tribulation, he doesn't use the definite article either. Nor in Revelation 7, 14, when great tribulation is mentioned, it's clearly speaking of that period of time, but the definite article isn't being used. So does this refer to the great tribulation or to just great tribulation? I suggest that for the previous generations, it was just great tribulation. For those of the last generation, it'll be the great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds. There was a way of escape. It was immediate repentance. Let's just be upfront and honest here, gang. God's patience is not eternal, but His judgment is. Now is the time to repent. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait until tomorrow. <clears throat> and I say that because uh, I've been hanging out with sheep a long time. I've been one for almost 57 years now. There are some of us here who have pretty tough backgrounds. There are some of you who are struggling in some pretty serious sin. Immorality even. Repent. Repent quickly. And stop playing games with God. Because it's not a game. And God's patience is not his endorsement. God is patient, willing just that you wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. Moving on, verse 23, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. He says, I will kill her children with death. That sounds pretty serious. If I was going to kill somebody, I think death would be a... Pretty good tool, you know. The word kill here, it means to kill off or to kill outright or to put to death. It really is a figure of speech that denotes a judicial execution. Really interesting, if you look at the Jezebel, the wife of Ahab in 1 Kings and then later in the early part of 2 Kings, three of her children died violently. Her son Ahaziah, he fell through a lattice, you remember? Um, and, and he dies as a result. Her son Jehoram was shot in the back by Yehu, the, the king of Israel's armies in the northern kingdom, who then assumed his position as king. And then she also had a daughter whose name, was, whose name was Athaliah. And Athaliah was the queen mother down in Jerusalem. Her, her son, who was king, died. And as queen mother, she ruled over the nation for six years. And then Jehoiada the priest got sick of it, right? And set up all the, the faithful and uh, installed a new king a grandson of hers that she didn't know existed, and uh, she was promptly taken out of the temple complex and executed. Kind of interesting, isn't it? 
Now, when he says, I will kill her children with death, obviously he's speaking of those who follow in her way. Those who are seduced into immorality and idolatry. They'll die as well, he says. This sounds pretty serious. I don't think Jesus is playing games. This isn't that Jesus whose picture was on your wall as a kid with the long flowing blonde hair and the big blue eyes, you know, and that gentle look on his face. This is, uh, this is the one with eyes of flame and feet of brass, you know. And in the end, a lack of repentance does lead to death, gang. You know, over the past several years, I've been just tracking the mainline denominations and what's going on is they have been not just tolerating immorality, but embracing it. The ELCA churches at one time boasted 5 million members. The number has been consistently dropping since they became very liberal in terms of social issues and the LGBTQ uh, issues that go there. By 2050, the denomination's membership is expected to be about 67,000 people, down from 5 million. And they expect that by 2041, just 17 years from now, the regular church attendance will be down to 16,000 people. You know why? Immorality brings death. The United Methodist Church just completed a, a, a split after five years, right? As a result... 25% of the congregations left the denomination immediately. The denomination went from 30,000 churches to 23,000. But here's the kicker. The congregations that left were the conservative ones. It means three out of four were still willing to embrace what the denomination itself embraced. Presbyterian USA denomination. They've been declining since 2014 when they embraced gay clergy. In 2022 alone, they lost 53,000 members in 100 churches. The denominations are dying because apostasy and immorality always bring death. See, the devil couldn't beat the church in Smyrna, so he joined the churches in Pergamos and Thyatira. And then Jesus says this, And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. See, God was dealing in real time and using them as an object lesson to all the churches. We are supposed to learn, this church here today, we're supposed to learn from what we read here. Jesus hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change with contemporary social thought or the court of public opinion. That doesn't change. His truth is forever. It's eternal. And he says, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. You see, those flaming eyes, that scrutiny, doesn't just determine right from wrong, but the motivations behind it all. Because I can guarantee you, this particular individual in this church, it was an issue of the heart. It always is. The heart of every issue is the heart of man. He says, and I will give each one of you according to your works. Right, that's an, old, an age-old principle, sowing and reaping. What goes around, comes around, right? You sow what you reap. You sow to, to the carnal nature, you're going to reap death. You sow to the spiritual nature, you'll find life. And we certainly see that at the end of this book. Revelation chapter 20, as we see the great white throne judgment, beginning at verse 12. And I saw the dead and small and great standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I don't want according to my works. Does anybody here want to be judged according to your works? No, I think I want to be judged in light of his work on the cross. Verse 24. 
Now I say, uh, excuse me, now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. You here is in the plural, it refers to those who have remained faithful to Christ, right? To you, I say, to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, uh, a doctrine of immorality. God is love. Therefore, God loves everybody, regardless of what they do. Maybe, sure. But not apart from judgment. I raised a rebellious teenage son. Many of you know him. I loved him. I never stopped loving him. But judgment came on many, many occasions, right? And he repented in basic training. <laughs> he serves the Lord now. It's amazing, you know. It's a great thing when people come to repentance. But don't kid yourself and think that Jesus doesn't care. He says, you, uh, you who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say. As they say would seem to indicate this is a phrase that was being used at that particular time. The depths of Satan. <coughs> That's used to describe those who were involved in idolatry and immorality. How sad is that? The church should be seeking the deep things of God. Not the deep things of Satan, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, Paul writes, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. What are you looking for? And what are you seeking after? You think that new car is really going to satisfy you? Let me tell you about new cars. That new car smell only lasts for so long. And before you know it, it's full of crackers and raisins and fig newtons and all kinds of gnarly stuff in the back seats, and it's putrid as hell itself. Amen? <laughs> you think that big house is really going to satisfy you? You think another relationship, somehow that's going to bring completeness and peace to your life? Really? Or do you read the things of God's word? You read Revelation 21 and 22 and the things that God has prepared for us. Does your heart beat for that? Because where your treasure is, your heart will be. Amen? This is on you, I will put no other burden. No other burden other than to not tolerate this kind of Stuff in the church. But you here, interestingly, is in the plural. So it's not dir just directed to me, it's directed to all of us. <laughs> what do you mean, Bill? <laughs> what I mean is dealing with issues of sin in the church is all our responsibility. Now, I'm not saying you should be going around sniffing for sin, looking for issues, you know. Tell me about your life, you know, and where were you at this day and that time, and, you know, and no, you don't need that. But when people begin to flaunt it and think they're okay because of it and encourage it, it's just not my issue, it's yours as well. Take that brother or sister to the side. Talk to them. Show them God's word. If they won't listen, bring another brother with you. Matthew 18, them. But this is directed to all of us, gang. One man. Last I checked, I'm flesh and blood like you. I don't think there's any difference. I wear a bell. That's about it. We all got to keep our eyes open and be loving enough to not tolerate people, but take them aside and say, hey, you are in sin, and this is why. I think tolerance is often hateful. It's a hateful thing to let somebody remain in their sin and send them down the road and pretend like they're doing fine.
Verse 25, but hold fast what you have till I come. Hold fast, krateo, means to grab hold of, to retain, to keep, to cling, to retain. Essentially means to seize with strength or to possess with effort. It means there's effort you have to put into this. Hold on tightly to what you have. What do they have? The teaching of God's word. Something that's being rejected in churches all the time now. I, I don't know. If, what is a pastor teaching if he's not teaching God's word? Please help me. A couple of nice stories, a little illustration, make you feel good, send you home. That won't happen here. I hope you feel good, and I hope you're, you know, but, <laughs> but I hope it's God work, God's word that does that work in your life. Not the cult of personality, which I've never been accused of having much of anyway, so that's fine, you know. He says, hold fast until I come. That's interesting, because this is the first time the second coming is mentioned in the seven churches. In fact, it'll be mentioned in the next three of those letters, but the first three letters doesn't mention his coming it does now. How long are you and I called to be faithful then, gang? Until he comes. That's it. Verse 26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Oh, to he who overcomes. How does one overcome? Repentance, for sure. Right? Dealing with the issues that God brings to light, for sure. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. He says, he who overcomes and keeps my works. Well, what are the works of God? John chapter 6, you know it well. 28 and 29. They said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Listen, gang, believe Jesus, not Jezebel. I don't think we can preach that loud enough and, and as, as the churches in our country continue to go deeper and deeper into apostasy. Believe Jesus, not Jezebel. To him I will give power over the nations. There's a reward for the overcomer. There's a reward for those who maintain their faith. There are, is a reward for those who hold fast until he comes and is to rule and reign with him. That's, of course, when he reigns on the earth. That's the millennial age. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 Paul writes to Timothy and says, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, blessed and holy is he who has part of the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. God has a purpose in all of this, you know. Fostering your faith and, and, and refining you. He's preparing you because God's got all kinds of things planned for the future. In the messianic age, that thousand year period of time and even beyond. Verse 27 now. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels as I also have received from my father. Here Jesus is quoting out of Psalm 2. It's a psalm that anticipates his coming rule and his reign on the earth. In fact, the psalm begins with a question, why do the nations rage, right? Why do they rage against God and his Messiah? Then it moves to God's determination to give rule of the earth to his Messiah, and then there, it ends with an encouragement for us to receive the Messiah's reign and to place our trust in him. And so... Here then, just between verses 25 and 27, we, saw, we see a lot of end-time sort of allusions. There's his coming, the encouragement to keep his works until the end. There's the delegation of his authority to his people in the messianic age. 
and his rule over the world. Verse 8, and I will give him the morning star. Now, in ancient times, the planet Venus was often referred to as the morning star. It would catch the sun's light and reflect it in the early morning hours, and it signaled the dawn of the new day. And Jesus here refers to himself in the same way. Revelation 22, verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. I, I want to encourage you because, I mean, you saw the events of yesterday at that political rally. The world's nuts. Let's just be honest. The world's absolutely crazy. But there is a new day that's going to dawn. The messianic age is not far ahead of us. If you have Jesus, listen, you have all that you need. There's no need to find false teachers and cheap thrills. All that you need is in Christ. Verse 29, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is in the present tense. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's in the present tense. Jesus is dictating this to John 2,000 years ago, but the Holy Spirit is speaking in the here and now. Do you hear what the Spirit is saying? Maybe you're here this morning and you're sick and you're dying inside. Maybe you've walked this very road that the Scripture is warning us about. Maybe you've been looking for love in all the wrong places, buying into the empty promises of a corrupt world. You don't need another lover. You need the Lord. You don't need another relationship. You need the one who promises to never leave you or forsake you. You don't need another life coach or guru or spirit guide. You need Jesus Christ. And listen, if that's you this morning, you don't need to walk one more step down that road to hell. You can repent right here, right now. You can turn it all around. I'm not talking about just saying sorry. I'm talking about repent. Doing the 180. Instead of moving away from God, move towards God. Might encourage you to confess your sin to him. It's not like he doesn't know already. Remember, eyes of flame? It's not like the Lord's going to say, Oh my goodness, I had no idea. He knows. But you've got to get honest with yourself to get honest with him. And having confessed your sins to God, turn away from your sin, conduct your life in the opposite direction. That's what real repentance is. And lastly, do what Psalm 2, verse 12 tells us. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Put your trust in Jesus Christ, the finished work of the cross. You will never be good enough for eternal life. You'll never be good enough to impress God. Hell is full of good people. Heaven is full of the forgiven by the way, who've been made good since. Amen. <laughs> That's going to be amazing. Step into heaven and I won't be such an idiot. And I won't annoy you so much. You won't annoy me. We'll all get along. Can't we all get along? You know? Put your faith, your trust, your reliance in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. There your sin is atoned for. There you'll find peace. There you'll find rest you'll find satisfaction and fulfillment. And beyond all of that, eternal life. All right? It's a heavy letter. He doesn't pull any punches. He speaks very plainly. What he says plainly, I choose to accept plainly. Amen? And if that's you this morning, you've been struggling in that lifestyle, I'm going to hang out here for a few minutes after the service. All right? And I encourage you. Uh, confess your sin to God. You don't need to confess it to me. But if you want somebody there with you, encouraging you along, put an arm around you, we can pray together. Amen? All right. Well, Father, thank you for 
Ah, a bittersweet word. Lord, um, bitter to the flesh and sweet to the soul. Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you revealed your heart. Not just a bunch of rules and regulations, but the heart behind it all. I pray for those who might be among us who are struggling in immorality or the idolatry. Lord, may today be the day they come clean before you, Lord, and are made clean before you. In Jesus' name.